The cross has been a feature of our Christian faith almost from the very beginning. This reminder of our crucified Lord, it's for centuries saturated our art, our architecture, even our jewelry. And yet, precisely because we see this cross so often, we may have become too used to it. Perhaps its message no longer challenges us as it should. In fact, I would argue that this must be the case, because every day, so many in our culture, we drive by this cross, and yet we remain largely unchanged and unchallenged by its message. And so I would suggest this morning that we've already seen our rude awakening image of the week. It's this symbol of the cross. And I would suggest we take another look at it this morning. Maybe this image needs to wake us up again. Because we don't want to be like the rest of our culture and just continue to drive by this cross and not see the powerful word that it means to speak to us. And so to look at the cross again today, I want to urge us to return to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. Mark, chapter 8. And we're going to pick up the story. If you look inside of your bulletin, we have the text there. You can follow along with the text and with the notes that are included. But the story goes like this, verse 31. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. A couple weeks ago, I was able to talk to you about the rejection that Jesus experienced in his own hometown. And now we see that rejection has come full circle. The leaders had now rejected him entirely and completely, and he was about to be put to death. And he had to prepare his disciples for the difficult days that were going to surround that death. And so he begins to talk to them about what's to take place and what it would mean for them. He uses this powerful phrase called the Son of Man. He calls himself the Son of Man. The title comes from the prophets Ezekiel and Daniel. And especially in Daniel, that title, it takes on powerful dimensions. In one of Daniel's visions, the Son of Man is described like this. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So you can see that Jesus is striking a note of discord intentionally here. On one hand, he claims to be this powerful son of man that's going to come and have everlasting dominion. And in the same breath, he says, that son of man must die. Clearly, he's messing with some treasure beliefs that the Jewish people had put their faith in. He was striking at the heart of their hope. He's clearly challenging our ability to understand because normally, see, a son of man that's going to take over and reign eternally, he wouldn't talk about dying. He wouldn't talk about the fact that he's going to have to die. He would be talking about the future and going forward. He would be preaching victory. Sure, he says he's going to rise again, but what does that mean? How are we supposed to process that? That's, that's, that's something that doesn't happen every day, and so it's hard for us to to get our arms around that. He's pressing the limits of our human ability to understand. And we could certainly understand why the disciples would have some serious concerns about this person they're following, this son of man, saying now he's going to die. Look at verse 32. Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Get this image. Peter is rebuking Jesus. <laughs> Peter's denying what Jesus is affirming. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, if you read this account, you hear Peter's very words. He says, never, Lord, this will never happen to you. I love the way Peter just like 
says what's on his mind. He just speaks from the heart. You know, he's one of those people, if it's in the brain, it's out the mouth, right? You know anybody like that? And I, and I love this because he says the kind of things that if I had guts to say them, I would say. Just a little bit earlier, he had made his confession. He said, Jesus, you're the Christ. You're this Messiah. You're going to be the one that's going to come and deliver Israel. You're going to be the one to restore David's throne to Israel. And so now to hear Jesus talk about dying, Peter was going to have none of that. He's not going to accept Jesus' defeatist attitude. He was not going to give up without a fight. And could you really disagree with him? I, I, I can't. The scriptures were pretty clear. This Son of Man was going to come. He was going to reign eternally. He was going to overcome his enemies, right? So if you're a person of faith, you would believe Jesus is going to win. Yes, there's going to be a battle. Yes, there are going to be enemies. But he's going to be victorious. He's destined to reign forever. Except for Jesus had another truth that he needed to share. Remember, he is the Word of God. He inspired those very prophets that made these promises. And so now he wants to clarify that prediction. He wants to clarify that Word. And he has this truth, this new truth. It's a very inconvenient truth. But the disciples are going to have to grasp it. They're not going to be able to look it. They're not going to be able to ignore it. And so he must address Peter in the harshest of terms. Look at verse 33. When, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now it's Jesus' turn to do the rebuking. He rebukes Peter. And when we look at the words, we say to ourselves, this seems just a little harsh. I mean, remember, Jesus, Peter's on your side. Do you really have to call him Satan? Is that helpful? Well, I think the reference takes us back to an earlier time in Jesus' life where Satan did confront him in the wilderness. And you remember the story. It's told briefly in the Gospel of Mark. In a fuller account, we find in Matthew and in Luke. And you, you read through that story of Satan tempting Jesus, and you realize at the heart of those temptations is this desire to appeal to Jesus to say, look, don't suffer. You don't need to suffer. You're the Son of God. Receive the glory now that's yours. You deserve it. Take the throne now. It's what you deserve. He's, it's a temptation to, to avoid this cruel death that was coming. One wonders when Peter says what he says if Jesus doesn't hear in those words, the words of the tempter, skip the death, bypass the death, go right to the throne. So he needs to correct Peter. And he has to do it in very harsh terms. And so he calls St. Peter to point out how dangerously wrong he really was. See, Jesus would not let Peter overlook this profound truth, this inconvenient truth, this basic historical fact that Jesus had to die to save the world. And you and I, we've got to face that fact as well. Now, things have changed a little bit, right? Peter, he couldn't see the future. He didn't know exactly what was coming. We have the benefit of looking in the past. We know what happened. Jesus did die. He did die on the cross, and so Satan lost that battle because Jesus was faithful. He went through with the death that was planned for him. So Satan has changed his game. Instead of preventing the death, he now tries to have us ignore it, to minimize it, to make it unimportant. Just another death among many deaths. Jesus is just another prophet, another teacher who died in a vain attempt to improve humanity. But see, here's the thing. If we view Christ's death that way, when we're just essentially participating in Satan's ploy, we're believing Satan's lie. See, in the will of God, in the ways of God, this death is central to everything. Jesus' death is unlike any other death. Jesus had to die to save the world. The world is not saved unless Jesus dies. 
which incidentally means that Jesus had to die for you and me. He had to die for me. I wasn't going to make it on my own unless Jesus died. It's a powerful truth, one that we have to grasp and embrace. We cannot avoid. It's an inconvenient truth, a troublesome truth, a hard truth, but we have to accept that Jesus had to die for me. But why did Jesus have to die? Why was it necessary for him to go to the cross? Great question. Glad you asked it. <laughs> Centuries had gone by. Theologians have debated it over and over again. And if you come back to our Clear Pathways classes that start in the next session, we'll be glad to explain it to you. But today, in this context, it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus doesn't describe it exactly. He doesn't answer the question directly. He doesn't say why he had to die. Instead, he looks at the disciples and he says, you're going to have to share in my death. And maybe through looking at that, we can begin to get just a glimpse of why Jesus had to die. Look at verse 34. Jesus says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. I think this would have been a very, very shocking thing for the disciples to hear. They thought they were following the Son of Man. They thought they were following the Messiah. They were following the King of Kings. They believed this man would win, that he would defeat his enemies, that he would take his place in the palace, and that they would reign alongside him on his throne. And Jesus is here telling them, nah, the pathway to that throne, it's going to be a less celebrated path than you think. It's going to involve this cross. And the cross in that time was the most horrible, cruel, painful, humiliating, degrading experience that you could possibly imagine. In fact, the cross, if you were a Roman citizen, you were exempted from having to die on that cross. You were exempted from crucifixion. The cross was reserved for hated thieves and low-life criminals and rebels and slaves, and foreigners, and Jews. The humiliation of the cross began way before you were actually hung upon it. You were taken to a public place, you were stripped naked, and you were whipped with, until you were bleeding profusely within an inch of your life. And then when the beating was over, you had to hoist the beam of your own cross upon your back and walk out through the crowds to the place of your own execution, all the while a sign around your neck advertising your crime. See, this is the path that Jesus is telling his disciples they must follow. They thought they were following the king. They thought they were in it for the glory. Now they find out they're following a rebel leader who's going to be taken captive and killed. And in those days when the rebel leader is killed, all the followers are executed as an example to everyone. Don't follow this leader. So Jesus would have to die. His disciples would have to follow in his death. Wow, Jesus. Way to motivate the troops. Way to give that pep talk before you, they run right into battle, right? Clearly, Jesus is saying, look, there's a cost to following Jesus. It could cost you something, maybe everything. The German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it this way. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Many of you know that Bonhoeffer was called upon to live out that truth. He was on the safety of American shores, and then he felt called to go back to the troubled homelands where the Nazi regime was devastating his flocks. And so he returned and 
fought that beast, Hitler, and all that regime, and ultimately had to pay that ultimate price for his rebellion. On April the 9th, 1945, Bonhoeffer was hung at a Nazi concentration camp, executed for his rebellion. Just 23 days before Hitler would surrender to the Allied forces. We read stories like that and it's very hard to listen to. Somebody having to die for their faith in that way. It's not a story we want to hear and it's not an example we want to follow. See, I suspect most of us, when we come to faith, we're like those disciples. We're in it to win. <laughs> we want the good stuff. We're following Jesus because he promised to save us and heal us and restore us. He's going to get our life back together. Maybe we're in it for the health and the wealth that comes from following the King of Kings. And so when we hear this kind of stuff that Jesus wants us to die, we don't know how to take it. We thought we were following Jesus to live. We're in it to win. We're not in it to suffer and bleed and die. So what's Jesus really calling us to do? What does he mean when he says we have to die to follow him? Let's look at the text again. Verse 35. He says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Very soon now, the authorities were going to come for Jesus. They were going to take him, arrest him, try him, execute him. And when all this went down, the disciples were going to have to make a decision. Would they follow Jesus to their own death? Or would they deny him to save their own life? Jesus wants them to think carefully about that decision. He wants them to understand that following Jesus will require some sacrifice. It will require letting some things go. You may have to follow him to uncomfortable places. It may cost you something. It may cost you everything. But he wants you. He wants it all. I think when Jesus calls us to come and die, when he says you must carry his cross, what he's really saying to us is he wants all of us, everything. He wants us all in. Nothing holding back. He wants our life, our body, our possessions, our passions, our will, our plans, our future, our families, our relationships. He wants absolutely everything. He wants it all because he knows if you give it to him, he can give it back to you. Fuller and richer than it ever was before. He will give you that full abundant life that he's always promised to his faithful followers. But it's hard for us to grasp. We're leery about giving him everything. We want to hold on, but Jesus wants to understand that we have to give him all if it's going to work. But why? Why does it have to work this way? Why can't Jesus be a person in our life that we acknowledge from time to time? Why does he have to be absolutely everything to us? Why do we have to give it all to him? Well, I think on one level, it's because we can't be trusted with it ourselves. See, most of us, we can't handle the responsibility of running our own life well. We make mistakes. We're going to make bad decisions. And often we're going to follow dangerous passions that end up destroying us. Destroy our life, destroy our body, destroy our family, destroy our, our relationships, destroy our fortunes, destroy our soul. Look at verse 36. Jesus says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The soul is a powerful word in the Bible. It refers to our core. It refers to what's at the very center. It's what drives us. It's what determines our actions. It what, it's what directs our decision. It's that fire that burns, that decision-making process. It's that very core that decides what we're going to do and where we're going to go. 
Jesus is making a very obvious point here. If that device is broken, if your soul is broken, you're going to have ruined lives. Something has to grab that center, that core, that soul, and drive it in the right place. Jesus is saying he's that right place. You give him your soul. You give him your control center. You give him your passions, your drive. You let him decide your decisions. We let him to take over in the inner self, and he will give us our life back. See, the truth is, we're going to make bad decisions, but we need to give everything to him because we need his truth. We need his wisdom. We need his righteousness. We need his power. We need his authority. We need his love. We need him. And so we give ourselves all of him, everything, nothing holding back, because we desperately need him to save us from ourselves. But I think there's another reason as well. I think we give Jesus everything because we live in a wicked, messed up, screwed up, confused world. The world out there, it's trying to take everything from us. It's trying to take our soul. Evil's out there trying to destroy us. And we need the power of God to direct us through that valley of shadow of death. We need his authority and his power. And so we give, give everything to him, to his truth, to his way, because only he knows how to negotiate through all that pain and all that suffering and all that hardship and all that evil. Only he knows how to traverse that ground until we get to that place where the Son of Man does come back and where he does restore the kingdom, where he does bring us into his fold. We need him to take us from here to there. We need to give it all to him, trust it to him to bring us to the place where we belong. Let's look one more time at the text, verse 38. Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. There's this one last charge, this one last reminder to the disciples. When the authorities come to take him captive, what are they going to do? They need to be careful about the decision because it could have eternal consequences. Whether we decide to follow Christ and go all in, or whether we're ashamed and walk away. Well, we know how the story turns out, don't we? The truth is, the disciples do deny him. They cower. Even Peter, as brave as he was, he fought for a moment, but then he failed the test as well. And if that were the end, if that were the end of the story, then they would not receive the prize and the glory that God planned to them. But in God's mercy, he did not take their denial as their last word. In God's mercy, he doesn't always take our denial as our last word. He keeps after us. And the truth is, if we follow the story, we know that these disciples were restored. Jesus took these ashamed failures and turned them into proud and, and bold spokesmen for the gospel and the glory of Christ. They were proud champions of his kingdom. And yes, it cost them something. It cost them a lot. In Acts, we read that James, one of the disciples, Herod, killed him already early in the faith, one disciple down. He said he looked for Peter. And if we believe tradition, we believe at least seven of the other apostles, they had to die a martyr's death. One tradition even says Peter himself was crucified and chose to be crucified upside down, not worthy to be crucified as his Lord was crucified. But whatever happened, somewhere in there, those failures, those deniers learned that this Son of Man was worth following, and God in His mercy gives them another chance. And you look at these restored disciples. You look at people like Bonhoeffer, some of these other men and women that have given their life for their faith, and you wonder, how did they do that? How did they get in that place where their very life was put under pressure and, 
and they made a decision to follow Jesus. And you wonder if this vision wasn't in their head. This vision of a son of man that was coming back to set things right. They knew they lived in the middle of an evil and adulterous generation. They knew they were going to suffer. They knew that this was all wrong. But they had a vision of a Jesus who they knew and they could trust with everything because they knew Jesus was still leading them through the valley of the shadow of that death. They understood somehow that their rich, full, abundant life it lie on the other side of that sacrifice. Somehow, if they were faithful, God would be faithful. And what about you and me? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I like to think if I got in that situation and a gun was at my head, I'd be like, I'm following Jesus. But the truth is, I'm a bit of a chicken and a bit of a coward, and I don't like pain, so I don't know. And I suppose none of us do, really, until we're in that situation. And I pray I'd have the strength of these men and women that have been courageous, but I'm not sure I do. But I can learn. I can practice. I can experience this truth that when you give it all to Jesus, everything he can help you endure the cost. See, we have to endure that cost, don't we? We know it already. Sometimes we have to give something up to follow Jesus. I know stories, you probably know them as well, that people in the business world, they just had to draw the line somewhere and said, you know what, we're not going to do something dishonest. We're not going to do something just to make the quick buck. We're, we're going to follow Jesus' way, and people lose their jobs over making decisions like that. Some of you, you're living witnesses and testimonies to the fact that it cost you something because you were in a relationship and then you found God and somehow that came to you and said, I got to let go of this relationship because I know that's not what God wants and it hurt and it was painful and nobody understood. But you know the cost of following Jesus. You've experienced that and you realize later on, yeah, that's what God wanted. It hurt, but God gave me my life back when I let go of that. Some of you parents, you experience that cost and that pain all the time, right? Because you're here trying to raise your children and the world's out there saying, it's okay if they watch that. It's okay if they do that. It's okay if they go there. And you're like this lone voice in the wilderness saying, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And all of a sudden, you're not the most popular person in your house. There's a cost for following Jesus. The other parents aren't going to get it. The schools may not get it. The coaches may not get it. But as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. And who knows, but maybe even sooner rather than later, we might get to a place where the government's not going to be too happy with us because there are certain laws that we just can't follow. It's a violation of our faith. And we may have to be in that place of affirming Jesus or affirming Caesar, and we're going to have to decide. See, every day we come into those places where we make those decisions. And when we do, we have to keep that image of this Son of Man firmly in mind. That Son of Man who came to save us from evil. Whether that's evil in ourselves, the passions that try to reign us, or evil in the world that's trying to des destroy us, we need to keep our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. We give to him what we cannot keep for ourselves He will hold that which we give to him against that day. So what about it? Are you really ready to give it all to Jesus? This week when we drive by the crosses or we see him in our jewelry, we see him in the art, or we read about them, can they be reminders to us not to forget this message that Jesus wants us all in? He wants all of us. It's a reminder at those times of decision that, you know what, we're going to tell the truth. We're going to stick by what God wants because we're not going to give up on that because he's the author and finisher of our faith. He is the Son of Man coming back to judge the living and the dead. We will make decisions based on that. We're put in that places where those evil passions from the world are warring in us. We say that cross and remember, you know what, I'm here to help people, not to hurt them. 
I'm here to love people in the image of Christ, not to lust after them. I'm here to build people up, not rip people down. That's who I am. That's who Jesus made me to be. I'm going to be all in for Jesus at this moment. And when we come to those tough places where we have to make those sacrifices, let that cross remind us that Jesus went that way. He did suffer. He did die. He did rise again to give us that power and that knowledge and that certainty that there is a rich, full, abundant life on the other side of our sacrifice if only we trust in him. And really, when we survey that cross, do we really have another, another choice? Love so amazing, love so divine, it really does demand our soul, our life, our all. Let's pray. Father God, we look at this image of the cross and we are, we are humble by the price you had to pay for us. We're humbled by the fact that you died to give us our life back. And Father, we confess to you that we've been trying to take it back to ourselves. We want to own it again. And we just want to be reminded by the, this symbol to give it all back to you. Everything. Our wills, our passions, our plans, our bodies, our souls. Please take it. Because we know in you we are safe. You protect us from our own harmful desires and you protect us from the evil of this world to lead us through even the suffering and the pain to the safe place of your glory where you reward faithfulness. And so, Father, once again, we just commit ourselves to you to be used by you for your glory and your gospel. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.